All right, here we go. Jimmy D and the Wolf. Bang. Another podcast. Yeah, man. A beautiful, cloudy Saturday in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Great to be alive. Great to be alive. That's right. Things are a little bit glitchy in the world right now. Things are getting a little weird. Some glitches in the Matrix. Yeah, some glitches in the Matrix. So it is good to be alive. Wrote a cool song this morning. Oh, yes. Kind of uh, copy and paste. It was interesting the way that we did it. We sort of took different lines from different ideas that you had and even copied and pasted a couple of uh, different compositional ideas musically to... yeah. To get the like the water music behind it, you know, it's. I think it's up there as long. Yeah, as it's it's great, man. You know, and it's a fascinating thing. It's like for all of the websites that have songwriting critiques, and for all of the data out there, all the books that have been written, and how to write a song, and the rules, the seven rules of songwriting, and The only thing that I've learned for certain about writing songs is there's no rules to it, man. There are no rules. Yeah. Like, we've used many different methods, you know. We've done it all the way from, here's a lyrical idea. Now let's create the melody. To, here's the melody. Now let's create the the lyrics and the music. To, here's the music, so let's create the... All the way to composing what we're going to sing on piano. And it's just, it's still, man, it's constantly unfolding. And I think it's part of what keeps us so interested in it, the magic of it, is because there's an infinite number of ways to do it. Like today, we've written many songs, and today we've never written a song like that. We just grab different ideas from different things and kind of put it all in a pile and somehow it worked. And it was easy to do, you know. We were cutting up and talking about a million different things. We, we were. It, it didn't even feel like we were writing. I mean, right. it wasn't an intense session. Yeah. So and the song was really good, yeah. I thought. I think that's, well, we'll see. We'll get it uh, finished up, demoed up, and recorded. And Yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, I think where you you reach a place now, neither of us have had, by definition, a hit song right, hit, you know, that's right. charted. So, uh, you know, would say, what do they know? But, I mean, what is success? We talked about it in the last podcast. What yeah. is success? Writing songs that you love, you yourself love, well, and, and that other people react to. You said some, you've done some of our songs in some of your live gigs, and you've gotten some really good reactions. Uh, sure, there's some people who love my stuff. And, you know, to me, it's important to not be encumbered in that sense. You know, to have creative and artistic freedom and to write the songs that you want and to be able to go whatever direction you want. I know writers that have gotten major label pub deals that were miserable writing for labels because they'll literally give you a tip sheet. These are the words that are working on Clear Channel Radio. This is the content. This is the stuff we want you to write about. Yeah, I mean, that... The industry is not designed for creative freedom. It's designed like an assembly line. Like, well, this thing worked. So we want more uh, country songs written about the tailgate of the truck down and the girl in the cutoff jeans and shaking it with the Budweiser in her hand. You know what I'm talking yeah, about, absolutely, man. It's yeah. so cliche, and that's why country music, especially country music, be, becomes so cliche and lots of other genres have suffered because of it but I've known people that were great writers that would say you know it's almost like paint by numbers when you get a major label pub deal they're not looking for you to write your best song they don't care if it touches people or not or how it affects people it's all numbers it's all about the money you know of course well and whereas I think both of us we've said we'd love to get cuts sure but we're writing our songs to sing them, aren't we? At least I'm Absolutely. writing most of my songs man. to sing yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, it's a great feeling to have enough original songs to do 
a whole show, not just like a, a, a showcase, but like a whole bar show, you know, a three hour thing where you could, you could just play all your stuff or have enough songs to go different directions with it. You know, it's like you take moods. At least I do. Like I, I do so many gigs, man. That like if I did the same thing every night, I would hate life. If I just went and played the same 30 songs every single night, I would have quit a long time ago. Some people can do that, you know, mm -hmm. and not taking anything away from artists that do that. God bless mm -hmm. them. But could you imagine, you know, think about B.B. King. He was in the Guinness Book of World Records for doing more shows than anybody. Don't you think he probably despised The Thrill is Gone by the time <laughs> it was all over with? You know, he's probably like, eh, and he had to play it. It was a signature thing. I'm sure that guy would maybe never admit it. but Well, I know. It depends on the song, I think. I mean, yeah. I have two references that come to mind right now. One of them is Billy Joel, who, uh, even though I'm not really originally as a piano player, I love his writing and his songs. Uh, he really doesn't care for a couple of the songs, based on what I've read. He really doesn't like Piano Man, because he wrote that during a tough time of his life when he couldn't make anything go, so he's playing in a, th in a theater. And Wasn't it sped up? Uh, that could be. I don't know that detail. And I know he doesn't like, um, we didn't start the fire. Really? He does not like that song. Well, based on the interview that I said, maybe that was he was in a bad mood that day, but he said he didn't like it because it was kind of a throwaway song. They needed a, a, they needed a cut, or the, uh, and he just kind of threw it together. Well, that's how it happens, man. I mean, people never love the song that the artist loves the most. I mean, his favorite songs are some of my favorite of his. I mean, I love New York State of Mind. Yeah, we've talked about that. We listened to. Yeah. I'm, I forced you to listen to that on the way back from it's a Orlando. Great tune, and it's interesting that you made the comment. He doesn't write with other writers. It's all based on. It's all him, man. One, uh, I went to a writers' round in Nashville, Tin Pan Alley South. Tin Pan Alley South. We should go is, that. We got to go that. Well, that's, they that's, they canceled it or postponed it. Did they cancel already or postpone it? Because yeah, because of. But why? The tornado, probably. <laughs> and or the... They didn't have enough songs? that we refused to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of the, the, the writers who plays keyboards, one of the few writers, and he says, I'm one of the few keyboard guys, and I wish I remember his name, James. Great guy. Um, his big hit was a song about going to Mexico. Anyway, man, I'll put that in the comment. I'll put that in the, in the video. Uh, anyway, he said that uh, he starts his thing where... No, this was at NSAI where he's lecturing. It wasn't at Tin Pan South. And he was giving a lecture, and he said... Uh, NSAI, Nashville Songwriters Association. He was giving a, a lesson or, or a lecture, I guess. And he started off by saying, Billy Joel never wrote a song with anyone else, and Elton John never wrote a song by himself. Being a keyboard wow. player, those were his two main influences. And so he was just making a point that there's more ways to skin a cat. Now, I know I've read that Billy Joel, his writing technique is to complete the chords and melody first and then fit lyrics to it. Really? Yeah, I've heard that's how he writes. That's interesting. Everybody has a different... Yeah, and Elton John, based on what I read, of course, Bernie Taupin would write lyrics. It's seri I mean, it's a sequential. They were never in the room together. They could live in opposite ends of the country with the internet. He would write lyrics, send him completed lyrics off to, to Elton. Bernie Taupin would write Yeah, them. and uh, Elton would compose the chords and the melody to the song, to the lyrics that Bernie had written. And that's how they operated. Now, Elton, for a while, I mean, Elton has written songs with other writers than Bernie Taupin. Sure. But all the big hits have been with Bernie Taupin. Just a great dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, and they were put together by record company or publishing company or whatever it was that they were working with. And according to what I heard, well, Elton John said it at the concert that I was at. He said, I never wanted to be an artist. I just wanted to write songs. You know, everybody told him no. Yes. You know, yeah. he was told no. It's a nice case study, you know, for our indie artist listeners, viewers. Look at Elton. 
I mean, one of the greatest songwriters, oh, performers just, yeah. of all time, oh, super absolutely. soulful, absolutely. Absolutely. timeless songs. Yeah. Everybody told him no. I mean, he was rejected over and over and over and over again. And nobody would cut any of his songs, so he decided to do your song. I think that was our first breakout, mm -hmm. right? And he recorded that and uh, just broke out. Yeah. Um, What's amazing, you know, and I'm sure there was a point in his career that, that, that all artists reach, not all, but most. I'm certain there was a point in Elton John's career where nobody believed in him but himself. I think many artists go through that. There's a point where you feel like, because it's ebb and flow, you know, there's so many up and downs. You know, talking about history of bands, I mean, I'm a, uh, and let's talk about the Canadian Irish thing, maybe. But Randy Bachman, I want to talk about Randy Bachman, who, uh, a great guitar player, great writer, and of course he was with the Guess Who. Mm -hmm. And he and Burton Cummings, who was a keyboard player for the Guess Who, just butted heads. And, he, and then he became a Mormon, and he really rejected... He wrote American Woman, of course, which was their biggest hits. And he rejected the lifestyle that was being led, and he became very uh, you know, straight-laced, wouldn't do drugs and alcohol, and uh, that was not the lifestyle of the rock and roll in the 60s. Sure. And that was a huge problem. And he ended up... That wasn't the only problem. And then he left them and started his own band... And it evolved through a number of things. And in the beginning of the band, it had three, I think it had at least three, it had four Bachman brothers in the band. Randy, I think, was the oldest. The drummer was a Bachman. There was a rhythm guitar player who was a Bachman. I don't remember their names. And the manager was a Bachman. All wow. his brothers. Now, unfortunately, when they were inducted into the Canadian equivalent of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or, or some, uh, an event like that, his brother wouldn't play with him. Oh, brother. man. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Siblings. Siblings, yeah. It's but terrible. But his main drive with Bachman Turner Overdrive was to have a greater success because when he left Guess the Guess Who, Burton Cummings told him, you'll never amount to anything without me. And his biggest drive, kind of like Kobe's biggest drive after he split up with from Shaq, Sure. Is he wanted to have greater success without Burton Cummings, sure. just like Kobe wanted to have greater success than Shaq. Uh, that was a that was a rabbit trail, anyway. No, it's, um, it's interesting, and he did. He they, for a while they dominated the mid seventies. Well, back BTO just dominated. We've talked about it, and and now probably as much or more than ever, man. The Canadians they punch above their weight, right? When they, comes to the music industry and the music business, and I think it's there's so much support from the Canadian government for artists, and they, they try to nurture their talent, where the United States government's never going to do that. They couldn't possibly care less. There's, you know, there's a, uh, a house on, on Music Row downtown for Canadian songwriters. I've had rights there with other people, and they will pay X amount of dollars for... Canadian writers to come to Nashville and study songcraft. Could you right, see I've the, heard that. Yeah. Could you see the United States government ever giving <laughs> enough of a crap to do anything? That's a, that's never going to happen here. And, and and they're being nurtured and they're being supported, which is brilliant. And they're absolutely punching above their way weight. above. If you, if you consider the Canadian population is like ten percent of the American population. Sure. And way, way, way more than ten percent of our entertainers, both oh, yeah. artists and even in actors. I mean, you can just start naming off the names sure. of the actors that are Canadian. Ryan Reynolds, Canadian. He's a recent big guy. Uh, um, I, mean, I can't think. They've of had him. some powerhouse bands. Jim Carrey. Um, the the uh, the uh, uh, Wayne's World guy. Uh, which one, Dana? Not Dana, the other one, the one, the mastermind behind it, Mike, Mike Myers. Mike Canadian. Myers, he's Canadian. Uh, just of course in music, Justin Bieber's Canadian. Yeah. Uh, um, well, Neil Young. Call me still maybe. Who, music. Who, yeah, Neil Young. Uh, uh, call me maybe, girl. Uh, what was her name? Call me maybe. I don't remember her name. I think she was Canadian, and uh, 
Just so many, so many. Oh, yeah, and lots they of just, they just too. Great, great quality. Neil, Neil, uh, or not Neil. I was thinking Neil Stack. Paul Anka referenced it. He's Canadian. Yeah. And the, the, the Ross Golan in the, the podcast we were listening to asked him about that. And, uh, of course, Anka had a, a really smart response. He said, well, we only send our very best. That's right. Well, they, had, they would have to, man. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the, the numbers are staggering. Like they're, it's absolutely staggering. They're kind of kicking our butts, really, percentage wise. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. To yeah. have ten percent of our population, it just goes to say that what you know, are, and and even Cuba, in Cuba, as poor as Cuban is, and the population of Cuba is, I think, like ten million. Yeah, but it's always had a very rich, very rich. music history, yes. and they support even as poor as the country is. They support. I mean, I've met people when I was with, when I spent a lot of time with Taxi. I met some uh, people who were tied, closely tied, and we even go there. I met a particular guy, and he told me the story. Actually, it was a really emotional story about how I think his parents were from there. And he, this guy was an amazing percussionist. Yeah. I mean, just off the charts good. And he was talking about going there and the quality of the, the, the music. Well, it's music. fascinating since all of that's kind of opened up how much it's really affected pop music. I mean, hmm. it's everywhere absolutely now. you hear it on the radio all over the place and i mean even uh back in the day my first exposure to uh, any kind of cuban music was buena vista social club and hearing that when i was just really diving into jazz in my early early to mid 20s that stuff is just mind-boggling i mean as as a as a white dude from america it's hard to count a lot of those rhythms even as a musician, it, it's it's just so richly ingrained in those people, you know. And it, it's not an easy thing for us to perceive, or at least for me personally to perceive. But they're on a whole nother level rhythmically, I believe. And now it's it's really cool to hear that effect in pop music now, yeah, because yeah. that influences. Camilla Ca Camilla Cabello is uh, is Cuban, I think Cuban American. Havana, na na na. Yeah, I love the per the percussion that's being interjected yeah. into pop music now. It's pop music now is musically more interesting than it's ever been before. It is. It is. You know, a lot of people do poo poo it, but it's, it's well. I'm, even the production of, you know, we discussed yesterday. Of, I don't want to get too deep in it, but interjecting an instrument for one measure and then that instrument's gone for the rest of the song. Yeah, we were we were looking at uh, Sucker by. Uh, by uh, the Jonas Brothers. Yeah, I wonder how much involvement they have, or it was their producer who did all that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that it was their producer. Producers, yeah, you know, because those guys, th that is the extra member of the band, and you could write the greatest song ever and now pour your heart and soul into it. Charlie if you Puth don't have production. Charlie Puth is he has a degree, I think, from Berkeley in in engineering producing. Side yeah, of he is a very comfortable. At you a know, console. I like that guy. He's yeah. like a uh, uh, him and who's the the other guy? And I know they're. I always think of him and Sean Mendez as kind of. Is that who you're thinking of? No, I'm they're thinking kind of about, about the, the same other, age. the real soulful guy, the uh, uh, Louis Capaldi. No, yeah, yeah, Scottish dude, Scottish guy. Yeah, those two guys in my mind are kind of throwbacks. They're like, I know they're not called this or categorized as this but I kind of think of them almost like soul like contemporary soul music because they're just really soulful cats you know well like in the 70s Louis Capaldi I mean Louis Capaldi's amazing and he, and he and talk about somebody going from zero to 60 in like one second yeah he's just absolutely and amazing. young and he's yeah. just 22 old 23 soul. yeah I think he's 23 early 20s. and you know that stuff it's not really a brand new thing it's just he writes great songs and it's really soulful. If he would have come out in the seventies, you know, he would have been one of many. Well, he would have done well, but he, he would have done well. But you know, he'd be he would be played on the same stations as Bill Withers and Absolutely. Donny Hathaway yeah. And, yeah. and Stevie Wonder, maybe. Yeah. And it's not that much of a stretch to think in those terms that the new artists they're just tapping into. It. Every, they're using the same ingredients those guys were using back then. They're just cooking the dish a different way. Well, you know, let's talk about 
Ireland, but also even the UK. The UK is oh, only man, they, 50, 60 million people. And they're like one always, sixth or so. I mean, yeah. Scottish, I mean, Scotland is part of the UK. Although sure. I remember going to Scotland, Edinburgh, and looking at the crown jewels of Scotland, and the guy says, The Queen of England will never wear these jewels. Yeah. You know, there still there's a little bit of that, little bit of that tension. Well, the, the Brits, man, I mean, it's undeniable that. Punch you know, above their weight. At, oh, yeah. You look at yeah. rock and roll. You know, the, the average... I love rock and roll, and I know you do too. And the average rock and roll fan, if you say, name the 10 greatest rock and roll bands of all times. The majority of them. They British. may name off 10 bands I mean, yeah, yeah. from England. And if not 10, they're going to name off a bunch of bands from England. And it's interesting. I heard a musician from England make the quote one time. I heard a guy say, you know, y'all didn't invent the blues. And he said, no, but we perfected it. And there's an argument to be made for that because of racism here, you know what I mean? The Americans weren't yeah. listening to they, Maybe they were listening to it, but weren't taking seriously the value of blues music because I mean, of racism. And, uh, you know, the Brits didn't care. They got a hold of that and just blew it up, and it's still that way. I mean, just go down the list of classic. You, if you go listen to classic rock, the majority of the bands you're going to hear are British. It's staggering. It's going to be, you know, well, and Beatles. How many great. It's going to be really Led Zeppelin. Right. It's, great. The Stones. Stones. The Who. The Who, yeah. Uh, uh, Pink Floyd. Black yeah, Sabbath. Yeah. All of these bands, each one of these bands, you could argue are the single greatest rock and roll band of all time. Yeah. And, you know, America, it's like... Then you get in... What's our argument Oasis? from here? You know, For, we had the Allman Brothers. What? what what's... <laughs> It's like, what can we The monkeys. Even? We had the monkeys. monkeys Don't forget about the monkeys. <laughs> Elvis. We had a lot of incredible black artists, you we know. Did. The Beach Boys. Yeah, the know? Beach Boys were great. Uh, but yeah, they've definitely punched above their weight, and so have the Irish, you know. There's, for the little bitty island, there's always lots of talent coming out of there, and that's where most of the... Yeah, you were. I didn't realize you said there are only three million yeah. people in Ireland. That blows my mind. Yeah. It's Southern Island. It's it's fascinating, and they're always sending us these little gems, you know. YouTube. Well, Sinead O'Connor was Sinead Irish. Sinead O'Connor right? was Irish. Yeah. Uh, Thin Lizzy, the guitarist for Thin Lizzy, and now it's, I think Liam Neeson's Irish. The Irish are always punching them other way. They're just very spirited. Not that I'm partial to Irish people or anything. <laughs> No Irish it heritage. Is, it is, no it, Irish heritage at all is, there. Right. It is interesting <laughs> to see, you know, what a small percentage of the world really had such an impact on the world. They're just really spirited people. Even in, um, um, who's the UFC guy? Um, uh, Connor. Connor. Uh, Connor McGregor. You know, that guy is so influential. Yeah. You know, people and, love him. Or yeah. they hate him. Or they hate him, yeah. And that's the effect that many Irish people have on others is you either love them or hate them. You know, he's he's just got a style. You know, he's got a great personal style. He dresses like a, you know, he dresses yeah. to the nines. He's he's just got an aura about him. Sure. Now, outside the ring, not even, you know, in the, in the the uh, on the mat or the ring or whatever. Well, yeah, that's what people are buying, you know. They're buying that flair. They're buying his personality. They're yeah. paying... 30 bucks or whatever it is to watch those fights because of his personality, not because yeah. he's undefeated. I mean, there's lots of fighters that are... It's almost hard for me to watch that stuff, man. It's just brutal. <laughs> yeah, what was... I didn't... With the last fight, didn't he knock the guy out in like 30 seconds? I'm not sure. Yeah, it was first round. I think it was like 30 seconds. And Tony Rob And it was a huge change for him. Uh, Tony Robbins talked about it at One Funnel Away. And Tony Robbins was his advisor for the last year and Tony Robbins was there at the fight and you, if you see the, the video of him he's he as, as soon as he declared the winner about the first person he hugged was Tony Robbins that's awesome and uh, Tony talked about it at one funnel away and he said did you notice that he went over and hugged the, his foe and his foe's mother who was ringside and he said the old Conor McGregor would not have done that because yeah. it was all about all anger all fight all you know for uh, ferocity ferocity uh being fierce um all the time yeah and and that doesn't work and 
Tony said he taught him to be a whole man and, and use that and have it when he needed it. But but it was just interesting. Of course, Tony, you know, is taking credit uh, where he can. Who We all do. We're all human beings. Mm. Uh, but I believe it. I mean, Tony Robbins is, is just uh, yeah. another level. I mean, like he's he said, once in a generation. Once in a generation type of Kind of guy, just listening to him talk and, yeah. and help people. I mean, yeah. I've That's seen... His, Instances where he he has a fifteen second conversation with somebody and changes their life. Absolutely, and he did. He calls them interventions. I think that's what he calls them. And he did tour. He did three of them at Funnel Hacking Live. And it's interesting because what he usually does is he doesn't really tell them anything. He just pries their own answer to their own question one hundred out of themselves. Yes. So yes. it's a fascinating thing to see when it's like. He asks them very, very specific, pointed yeah, questions. Right. He pulls it out of them. Pulls it and out. And they always have their own answer. They do. And I think most people do. You know, most people that are unhappy, you say, why are you unhappy? Well, I'm in a bad marriage. I don't make enough money. Well, leave your spouse and get a better job. You know what I mean? Well, what could you do to make it better? They always have the answers. They always know the answers. They just won't do it. Why? Why? I don't. I yeah. mean, it's a fear it thing, I guess. A, you know, our brain, well, our brain, this was, I can't remember which, it might have been Tom Bill, Bill Yo, is who somebody was at Fun Hacking Live, and I'm following him now, he's got great content, probably not pronouncing his name right. Uh, anyway, I think it, this was something that he posted, that our brains, and I even heard, one of the podcasts was talking about this we were listening to, our brains are not designed to make us happy. Our brains are designed... To, make to us keep us alive, day. yeah. To make keep us alive, and so right. risk averse. Do the same thing that worked yesterday. Don't try anything new. Exactly right. And we're wired to say no. We're wired to say no more than we're wired to say yes. Absolutely. But now we're in this uh, world where saying yes is the best thing you can do because there's opportunity after the opportunities are infinite now, and so it's almost like going against your instinctive thing. And we all do it. I mean, we do it all the time. Well, and it's the same thing when you're working out and you're trying to push yourself. And uh, trainers will say, uh, you know, the, the uh, person they're training will say, I can't go anymore. I can't do another rep. I can't do it. And, and the trainer will say, is that your brain telling you that or is that your body, your muscles telling you that? Yes. Is it your protective brain trying to protect you from sure. being hurt? Sure. Your brain will tell you to stop long before you literally can't do anymore. Absolutely. It's interesting. Not that definitely don't have that mastered, but I've just became aware of that concept. It's absolutely it's true. I've done, I've done that. I have done that in the gym to stop and say, I can't do any more and actually ask myself that question. Like, you know, maybe I can do a few more pull-ups because my shoulders don't hurt. Is my brain saying that that was the number that's the most that we can do? And then inevitably, almost almost every time. Sometimes you're dehydrated or whatever, and you just can't. But more times than not, you can do it. Yeah, our brains are uh, another example. I heard our brains take on our subconscious takes on so many messages yeah. at a time, yeah. way more than our conscious can yeah. can process. Uh, and so, Eric Ho says that your brain can process 11 million pieces of information per second but our conscious mind is only aware of around 40 of them so without really training your mind and really really focusing hard and habitual practice of trying to focus your thoughts on things that benefit you human beings aren't even driving their own buses the yeah. subconscious yeah. mind yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the reason why, you know, we can work things out. And I've done this with music before, and it's fascinating. Like, you can go to bed and and have your mind kind of clear and focus on a question and fall asleep with that question on your mind and wake up with the answer yeah. oftentimes because your subconscious mind, all that brain power, the mechanism is working as you sleep. It's interesting how that works, you know, and it's... I think that's one of the biggest secrets to like uber successful people. When you see people that say, well, I work two hours a day and make $40 million a year. And you're, what? How do you do that? You know, they're focusing all their energy in one place. It's all, they're not 
letting fear be any kind of aversion. What was, what just happened there? We got lights blinking. It's okay. It's Normally back on I now. wouldn't care, but there really has been a glitch in the matrix. For like <laughs> a I just don't want to like segue into a parallel dimension and never see my kids or you or my mom ever again, my wife. How do I get back to <laughs> exactly that portal? Right. Yeah. What was it in the remember in the actual Matrix movie? It was a cat going across uh, across the screen. Yeah, anyway. I'm afraid of slipping into the space time continuum glitch that's happening right now. <laughs> Being. A- <laughs> <laughs> Scary stuff. (laughs) Bright flash of light. Wake up in a universe where all the stores are stocked with toilet paper. (laughs) Everybody's super confident and feels safe. Yeah, that, and really helping each other out. That would just be, <laughs> that would be too much, man. Oh, I don't think, I think that's a crescendo. Can we, can we stop with yeah, that? Yeah, I think so, man. Now's a good time. Just All right. <laughs> Creamy D and the Wolf. Peace, everybody. <laughs>